What am I doing here? Stop sharing it for a moment. Okay, uh, 14 attendees at the moment, and uh, we are at the top of the hour when uh, we had uh, planned to start our webinar. Are you ready to start, Edward? Yes, perfect. Wonderful. So um, let's turn on recording, Pedro. It's on. Okay, thank you. And uh, welcome, everyone, to our, our, uh, this new episode of the Gaia Education Glocalizers series. My name is Giovanni Charlo. I'm the academic and e-learning coordinator at Gaia Education. I'm very excited to bring you this webinar entitled Regenerative Development, Recovering the Safe Operating Space for Human Societies with Dr. Edward Muller, President of the University for International Cooperation in Costa Rica. Hello, Edward. Hello, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this important series of, of webinars. Um, we're really delighted to be working with Gaia. Great, and uh, thank you for uh, making time to join us today. Uh, the webinar series is offered to build capacity in systems thinking design. So uh, a couple of housekeeping tips uh, before we get going. The, this webinar will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel for our later viewing, so you can share it with uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, please close any open program that you may not need during this time. Uh, so you have better bandwidth and not interfere with the webinar. Another thing is that uh, uh, attendees' microphone and video will be turned off during the webinar, but you can communicate with your host and panelists via the chat box or the question and answer area. Please pose any questions in the Q&A area for the panelists to answer at the end of the presentation. I also um, want to... Um, <laughs> point out other resources that Gaia Education makes available uh, on our website, such as the EDE curriculum, the activities guide, and the teacher's manual that you see here on this screen. This also include the uh, Sustainable Development Goals flashcards, now available in multiple languages. And we recently launched the uh, Trainers of Multipliers handbook for using the, uh, fla the SDG flash flashcards that I'm mentioning here now. You can uh, download uh, a free version of the handbook or also buy it online in full color. You can also purchase the SDG cards there. Um, uh, you can visit the address on the uh, screen to do that. You are also invited to check out our online courses offered on a yearly cycle in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. This is a full 10 month course that can also be taken in two month uh, chunks, but the uh, full uh, uh, certificate course is a 10 month course in those three languages. You can find out more about Gaia Education through our social media presence um, in obviously Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, Medium, and also uh, you can subscribe for our newsletter on our website. So we invite you to join us there so you can continue receiving news and uh, new programs coming up with Gaia Education. You can also learn how to become a Gaia Education certified trainers like the growing list of trainers on our roster. So uh, there is a process for this. You can visit our site to get more information on how to become a Gaia Education certified trainer. For today's webinar, I have the great honor of introducing Dr. Edward Muller and the webinar entitled Regenerative Development, Recovering the Safe Operating Space for Human Societies. Edward is the founder and president of University for International Cooperation in Costa Rica, which he has led since 1994. He's one of the global leaders on promoting regenerative development, a holistic approach based on planetary boundaries and the safe operating space for humanity. He also uh, is responsible for creating innovative solutions to the current challenges through transdisciplinary teams, the use of climate change and socioeconomic scenarios, and facilitating mitigation and adaptation strategies for a better planet. Edward's over 40 years of experience with fi in five continents and dozens of countries in a wide variety, in a wide range 
uh, of fields have enabled him to become an internationally recognized trendsetting leader. His work has covered management and innovation in higher education, global and climate change communication, and public and private consulting um, biodiversity initiatives and functional landscapes. He has adopted spirituality as the major change maker in human behavior, working, working closely with the Earth Charter Initiative and other international projects. He's also the chairholder of the UNESCO Chair for Biosphere Reserves and Natural and Mixed World Heritage Sites. It is such an honor to have you here, Edward. Welcome. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Gio, and thank you for all the people that are listening. I think um, this is a tremendous opportunity to start dialogues. Um, in a one-hour presentation, it's very difficult to cover a lot uh, without boring everybody. Uh, but actually, we started something very interesting, and guide education is part of it, and I'll keep that to the end of the presentation. So just hang on, because the surprise comes at the end. Uh, let me start... Uh, by uploading my, my presentation. Um, just a moment. And, okay. Let me see if I can get this out of the picture there. So, regenerative development. Um, I won't spend time right now at the beginning on, on definition, we'll go seeing what it is as we go along the, the talk. Um, again, thank you, Gaia Education, for this tremendous opportunity. We signed an agreement with Gaia earlier this year to cooperate in academic fields, and, and actually the Spanish version of the graduate program uh, will be coming with our participation. Uh, but I think it's, it's the basis for a, a lot more cooperation is, is, has been set and we'll be seeing each other very frequently. Um, what I want to ask, and I have a few questions at the beginning for you people uh, who are listening. I suppose you all have a dream. You've, you've all thought of how you wanna be living in 20 years, right? Um, I find it now that a lot of young people don't really think that far ahead. Uh, they're actually worried with what they're gonna do on, on next Friday. But in general terms, people should have thought of what they want in the future. And um, my other question is, okay, what could come in the way of reaching your dream? What are the most important challenges that we have today that could make your dream not come true or that could actually help your dream coming true? Um, another question. Is sustainable development still possible? We have the sustainable development goals. We have all this talk about sustainability. We wasted about 10 years, early 90s, discussing it was sustainable development or other definitions. Uh, and if you look up with Google today, you'll find hundreds of thousands or actually millions of links to sustainability but we still haven't achieved it. Um, we're not even close to achieving sustainability. And we have a disconnect of what it actually means. Um, for many people, the Syrian conflict is about a dictator that's backed by the Russians. And uh, a lot of people backed by other countries. Uh, but it's not a political issue. I mean, after many consecutive years of drought, over one and a half million farmers had to leave their lands behind and go to the city and demand services. And that's where actually the conflict starts. And this has been actually published in, in, in journals. Um, another question I wouldn't ask, could this be our civilization's historical moment? You know, the Roman Empire, the Greeks, all these, the Mayas, all these uh, previous civilizations that have collapsed. Um, I'd like to ask, is, is this our moment, or can we get out of it? Uh, we're seeing so many things happening around the planet. My country is now for 12 days in a row on strike. Um, and all over the place, uh, our neighboring countries, uh, everything is, is turning upside down. 
Are we conscious as human beings of what we have come to accept? That's another major question. And if we look at one simple day-to-day -day example, yogurt is supposed to be healthy, right? Well, have you looked at a label on a yogurt product lately? I mean, is it really necessary to put all that crap in there and make it an unhealthy food? Or even the candy we feed our, our kids with titanium dioxide uh, as a coloring, just to make it prettier. Um, I'm not sure if, if we are actually sleeping through all this process or we can actually start making changes. I want to go rapidly through how Earth's health is. And, and Earth health uh, is what defines our health. Actually, the UN system has called it the one health approach. Um, and I based a lot of my work for the last 10 years on the planetary boundaries approach from the Stockholm Resilience Center. If you look at um, the planet, uh, our safe operating space uh, for our current civilization is defined by how the planet can cope with the changes. And they have defined 12 major changes that are happening to the planet. And yes, we are in the Anthropocene. What does that mean? That basically the changes that are happening to our planet today are caused by us human beings. Now, I've given talks with this graph and the previous graph from 2009 uh, that was uh, published. Uh, I've given more than 200 talks using this graph. And whenever I ask the public, even specialized people working in ecology and biology and other things, and I say, well, which of these global changes, where climate change is one of them, is actually going to avoid you reaching your dream? And it's very few people that actually say biodiversity loss is probably the most important one. We're way beyond the zone of uncertainty. We're at high risk of losing our safe operating space. The second one is even harder for people to answer. Um, very few people actually can pin that down. They'll say fresh water. Some even say ozone layer, but it's actually fertilizers. Then comes land use change. And then in fourth place is climate change. So these four planetary boundaries are actually what can keep us from reaching our dreams. If we look at the role of agriculture, it is responsible for about 80% of global change. It's responsible for about 25 to 30% of climate change, but it is responsible for 80% global change. So we do need to work with agriculture. Another question I want to ask is, what is development? I'm coming from a German family. My father is from Germany, and I always thought, yeah, developing countries have to aspire to become like Germany. And if you look at the, the social threshold in Germany, it's perfect. I mean, people are satisfied in their lives. They're healthy. They have social support. They have education. But at what cost? Look at the biophysical boundaries that Germany has way surpassed. Um, if we look at the ecological footprint versus the biocapacity, um, Germany is unsustainable before I was even born. And Germany has reached its level of development because it has used resources from the rest of the planet. Its biocapacity is way, way over done. Let's look at other countries, China and Costa Rica. So if we look at China, there are a lot of white spaces in their so social, um, but they do have a huge problem with fertilizers, with CO2 emissions. And yes, we can blame China for a lot of what's happening now in terms of global change. But actually, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror because this computer I'm using is from China. My cell phone is from China. So we can actually not keep on pointing fingers at other people. We have to look at ourselves uh, to see how we can actually start changing our life. If we look at Costa Rica, actually I have lots of hope, not only because I'm Costa Rican, but Costa Rica is a country that has a pretty well-developed social component. Our inequality has been growing over the last decades, basically due to the neoliberal governments we've had and the opening to markets. Uh, we see Walmart coming in and ruining a lot of our farmers and bringing cheap food from Asia that don't 
is produced without our social networking, our social security, our educational level. So it's a lot cheaper to bring that food in and it ruins a lot of our farmers. Um, and a lot of other uh, companies that have come in and, and have actually made it harder for all of our population to be middle class. But we have done this without really exceeding that much our physical boundaries, our biophysical boundaries. So actually we don't have too much work ahead to reduce our CO2 emissions, to bring back our material and our ecological footprint, to recover our degraded lands and become a regenerative nation. And I think we're gonna make it uh, over the next years and show the planet that it is possible. This just came out this morning, uh, the new 2018 ecological footprint. And I recommend you look at it, at it and look at your countries and, and start analyzing what are the statistics behind this map. Our development process has been extractive. We've used nature to extract the last bit of drop. The last little drop of our resources has been extracted. We're actually way beyond the capacity of our and who has this benefited? Um, the 1%. The 1% is actually the one that is getting richer. And that 1% has more today than the other 99% of our world population. And uh, this is not by chance. This actually was planned. We know the businessmen that took part in Bretton Wood a meeting where the World Bank and the World Monetary Fund was established, and then the meetings in Geneva that led to other big economical groups defining how the planet should develop. And this definition actually was meant to channel the resources into a few. Uh, Lorenzo Fiaramonti, one of the big thinkers of the well being economy, calls it the gross domestic problem. In Spanish, it's Producto Interno Bruto, but I call it the Producto Interno para Brutos. Um, it's, according to Stiglitz and Amartya Sen and, and other economists, mismeasuring our lives. And we can see the relationship, a very narrow relationship be between growing GDP and growing inequality. So we're not doing the things correctly in terms of um, This study from and his group uh, show very clearly that with today's current GDP, we can actually support the maximum population that's expected to be on the planet with a per capita income of $7,000. So is it really impossible to achieve a better world? Pope Francis says it very clearly in the Laudato Si, and those who haven't read Laudato Si, please do. It's actually a very powerful document with a lot of solutions to what we're facing. And he mentioned that when people become self-centered and self-enclosed, their greed increases. The emptier person's heart is the more he or she needs to buy things, own and consume. And this is our consumer society. This slide, for those who know me, I've used it for close to 20 years now. Uh, and along 20 years, we're still in the best scientifically documented planet. We know exactly why we're gonna disappear. Um, the amount of data produced, in 2017, we produced more data than from 2016. Now, what happens is a lot of that data is transformed into information. Some of it is transformed into knowledge, but we forgot about wisdom. We forgot about and we really need to sit down and start thinking about things deeply uh, and being able to make changes in our society. I was lucky enough to be born in a very biodiverse country and in a region with a tremendous cultural heritage. Uh, cultural heritage, cultural diversity is being lost even quicker than by. On the left, that blonde kid, he was three and a half at that time. He looks like this now, he's my oldest son. And on the right, Sebastian, at that moment, he was three and a half. Also, he's now six. Well, Sebastian got to see only half the life that his older brother saw. Costa Rica and Central America have lost 50% of our biodiversity. We're not talking about species. We're talking about 
And science. We're in the sixth mass, mass extinction. By 2020, we'll have lost two thirds of the vertebrates. Biodiversity is actually falling below the safe levels to keep humanity alive in most of the territory of the planet. We look at the maps and we see all this red and that's way exceeded the levels of biodiversity that are needed to keep our, our ecosystems. So we talk about economic recessions, but ecological re recessions can be. And um, if you look at around the planet, what's happening, Germany already declared that 75% of its insects and we know that we need insects to survive, not only for pollination, but for producing soil and a lot of other things. Um, biomes, our big biomes. We used to think that the Amazon would save us by capturing CO2. Well, the news is out, it's not. Um, during the 2005 drought, the Amazon released the equivalent amount of carbon as the US. In 2010, in stronger drought, and the Amazon released an equivalent to China and Russia together in terms of CO2. We've been aware of this for a long time. By 2010, we had promised to stop by diversity loss. We didn't achieve it. I was part of the negotiators at Nagoya at the COP10 in Japan, and we finally managed to bring out the strategic plan, which actually killed the, kicked the ball forward for another 10 years. By 2020, we're supposed to stop biodiversity loss and we developed 20 targets, 20 simple targets like this one, where biodiversity values would be integrated into national accounting by 2020. The news is not good. And I think part of the problem is that we, when we started talking about environmental education, we made a big mistake because we, told people that they had to take care of nature. Uh, that by planting a tree and recycling a bottle, we would be taking care of nature. The truth is that nature does not need us. We need nature. We should have educated people to understanding that if we don't have nature, we're not on this planet. Agriculture. So what is the result of our chemical intensive agriculture? We have 2 billion hectares of land. We don't have many possibilities to keep on producing agriculture under the current conditions. But this we have to see as an opportunity. We have a playground of 2 billion hectares of degraded land where we can play and revitalize, regenerate them, capturing carbon and actually saving our planet in doing so. If we look at one week in March, of course, these pixels are not corresponding to size, but this is the fires in one week uh, in March this year middle of March. Um, we're crazy. As humans, we're crazy in what we're doing. Uh, I used to be a vet uh, many years ago, and I put this graph actually together when I was still working at, in veterinary. And it's a myth that fertilizer and pesticides have increased agricultural productivity. In Latin America, 30 years of chemicals did not change productivity. Look at modern Costa Rica. Over 30 years, we've increased our consumption of pesticides over 30%. And the crop yields are going down and down and down. We're producing 30% less coffee per hectare now, even with this amount of chemicals. And talking about chemicals, I mean, the rate of change, uh, what we've come to accept with chemicals. I mean, who had the bright idea of putting poison to what we're gonna eat? Look at Brazil, the dark spots are up to 1.5% of the population has been poisoned in all those dark brown spots. Actually, we should request these chemical companies to certify their products that are chemical. I mean, if it's so good, why force people who are doing the things correctly to pay a lot of money to get certified as non-chemical or organic? These companies, if they're so convinced that their products are good, they should put a, a stamp on it saying, this is chemical or this is GMO. It's good. We look at our countries. We know uh, that in 20 or 40 years, we won't be producing the food that we require to feed our populations. Let's look at climate change very quickly. Um, last week, we had, I think, eight 
hurricanes or storms uh, at the same time around the planet. Um, these are CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And these are all the big international meetings that we put together to try to reduce those emissions. Paris was successful, yes, countries accepted their responsibility and pleaded to implementation. It was also the last time any of us breathed in an atmosphere below 400 parts per million CO2 equivalent. Now, if we managed to implement 100% of Paris, we're still going to be fried. We're going into a very, very powerful climate change. So we need to do more. We need to do a lot more than just implement Paris. Now we have all these new issues, which are actually not new. This had been known in science for over 20 years. The release of methane in Siberia, in northern Canada, Alaska, in the South Pole. Uh, methane, again, scientists say, 23 times more powerful than CO2. Well, that's a long 100 years. In the first six years, methane is 80 times more powerful, warming up our planet. So this, this could actually lead to uh, unstoppable, uh, dramatic climate change. So we're now starting to enter the hot house. You can read more about that. I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, negative part because I want to go into the positive part. Um, what happens in this hot house? We're already seeing a huge amount of and we don't know the consequences of this change. Um, we do know that there are a lot of systems that are tied to other systems. So slowing down of the Gulf current will actually make Europe freeze in winters and heat in summers. And actually we had a pretty good summer this year. Uh, and if we look at the graph, I mean, the last years, it's just scary how quickly we're turning red. And this is actually uh, bringing a lot of other consequences into the Earth system. Last decade, yes, uh, some scientists are saying we have one decade to reduce 50% of emissions, and we should be reducing 50% every decade after that in order to save the planet. Um, but let me get into our solutions, and we call it regenerative development. We're talking about um, changing our system, and Daniel Val adapted this from Bill Reed and the Genesis group. Um, in the lower left corner, we have the degenerating system and up on the right, the regenerative system. And we have the, our development spiral. So conventional was actually just barely legal, maybe sometimes even not legal. The famous green economy discussed in the 20 plus real uh, conference uh, is very negative. I mean. It's greenwash. Actually, um, corporate responsibility, where you do a lot of philanthropy without changing your business model, that is not what we have to do. Sustainable is still negative. I mean, an environmental impact assessment allows you to re reduce your impacts, but you still are producing impacts. So we need to go up to the right corner of region. What is it? It's a holistic approach. And we have to recognize that the basis for the holistic approach is integrity and the function of all ecosystems. Productive ecosystems, natural ecosystems, urban ecosystems, they all have to be productive. And it's about equality, transparency, peace, true education, enlightenment, and even happiness. We're talking about well-being. We need to measure our development in terms of well-being. The Pope, again, says humans, above all, need to change. And we're talking about new convictions, new attitudes, and new forms of life. Uh, a great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us. And we're talking about long path of renewal. Actually, the Spanish version talks about regeneration here. So how do we approach this? After the Rio meeting in 1992, we thought sustainable development was bringing economy, social, and environmental issues together and working them in an inter integrated form, interdisciplinary. Um, about 25 years ago, I started thinking, no, we need to work on the political, cultural, and the spiritual. And if you make me choose, I choose the spiritual component above all the rest. Now, whenever I talk with other presidents of universities, especially the big important ones, and talk about spirituality, you know, they look at me 
what does this guy smoke this morning? You know, how, how are we going to bring spiritual components into quality education, which is supposed to be, you know, neutral. Um, we won't really make progress unless we start working in these three other components very, very strongly. So we need to really do this transdisciplinarily. And after 25 years of running this university and talking about transdisciplinarity, I can say it's not easy, but we're managing. And we're managing because we shifted into site-based approaches. So if we have a territory and we start thinking about regenerating the territory into functional landscapes and putting the layers on one on top of each other and working through the layers, so not horizontally, that would be disciplinary, but across the layers. So actually, this requires universities to change their structure. The faculties and the departments and everybody's still more and more specialized. Uh, you can only publish in peer-reviewed journals if you are very, very specific and, and, and specialized in what you're doing. Uh, we need to move away from this. We need to go into real, true holistic approaches uh, with other indicators of success. So, Coming down to the territory, um, we work at the farm level. We try to establish value chains between the different people that live in there. We try to generate additional income, empower people with entrepreneurship, uh, processing, direct market, circular economy at the local level. But we are going to be measuring the amount of carbon we can capture and the amount of biodiversity we can increase. Those are our two main indicators. So well-being, better education, better health, better business, circular economics at the local level are actually byproducts of our strategy. Important byproducts, very fundamental byproducts. Our main met metrics are CO2 and biodiversity. Right now we have three times more carbon in the soils than in vegetation or the atmosphere. And we can actually capture carbon, for example, with cattle grazing. Grasslands are the biggest carbon pump that we have. And there's more carbon sequestered in soils um, just behind the oceans. Um, if you look at the IPCC, cattle is responsible for most of climate change. Most of the warming of the planet is due to cattle. There again, it's a disciplinary approach. We have these good experts that go and measure the methane but they never looked at where the cattle is standing and the capacity grasslands have to car capture carbon. They have roots that are over two meters deep. And when you take off the green biomass, 80% of the biomass is chewed by cattle, 80% of the root system is released into the soil as organic matter. So it's a tremendous carbon pump. Or organic ag agriculture, we can capture a huge amount of carbon. Bamboo, up to 120 tons of hectare per hectare per year, both in biomass and the soil. And we have ecosystem regeneration. So basically, we start with the territory. We define which are the agricultural lands, which are the cattle production lands. And then we try to establish forms of natural regeneration, assisted regeneration to recover the rest of the ecosystems and their functionality. This increases resilience to climate change, allows for better adaptation, allows for the rivers to start flowing again, the aquifers to get replenished. And now we actually have brought in an additional uh, I would say the cherry on the pie. Uh, we're working with LandArt. This incredible friend of ours, Alex, uh, is planting trees to decorate, to actually paint uh, landscapes with it. And he's doing this with carbon money. So we can actually go into a territory that is visited by tourists and plant trees in such a way that we have pictures. We have beautiful landscapes which add value for tourism, for example. Um, I'm not going to go into urban because I don't have the time in this webinar, but we're also working with urban areas. Uh, it's amazing the, the, the progress that's happened over the last years. This is one example of San Jose connecting its city with corridors using the rivers and, and other areas. Here's a, a design of a project that has already started the first kilometer of green corridors crossing San Jose with bikeways, walkways, and increasing biodiversity. We actually have a city within San Jose, which within the large area, urban area, 
that is measuring its urban development by the amount of pollinators that are being monitored. So a city that measures urban development by pollinators, that is regeneration. Even New York. I mean, uh, I know Michael Sorkin who, who is doing this. There are lots of, lots of possibilities of, of starting to work with urban areas. But we, all, we have all the information. Um, the UNESCO map and the biosphere program from 1970s already showed us how to work in territories with gradients of use. In about 10, 10 years ago, we produced this document in the IUCN of natural solutions. Today, we call it nature-based solutions. All this information is there, ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, and we have examples. We had a beautiful workshop with Gaia Education and, and Capital Institute, a lot of other partners, Saver Institute, at Rancho Margot. Why? Rancho Margot is producing over 450,000 US dollars worth of biodiversity per year. And it's off the grid. It, yes, it is possible. We have example. We have many examples worldwide that show that we can do things differently. Uh, we signed an agreement with Cuba, the INIFAT, uh, in 2015. They are producing up to 180 tons of vegetables without any single chemical. They even produce their own seeds. That will annoy a lot of these big corporate companies that want to own the seeds. And up on the right corner, you see people waiting. They're standing in line. Actually, what they're doing is they're waiting for what they ask for. You ask for five carrots and, and two lettuce, and the farmers go and harvest them and bring them to you, harvested a few seconds before. The farmers get the true value. The consumer gets the true value. Uh, we were told that in Nicoya Peninsula, that's where one of our sub hubs is established right now, and we're starting to work with them. Well, we did, started about a year ago. And we demonstrated last year that we could produce, with the Cuban method, tremendous amounts of, of vegetables. And this lady here in the window, that's the first time I think she's seen a lettuce that was harvested just 10 minutes before, because this area was not supposed to be able to produce vegetables because of the climatic conditions. FAO is backing us up now. They're finally saying, yes, the future is organic agriculture. And we can outperform conventional agriculture with it. These are all myths. Even UNCTAD says, wake up before it's too late. The trade and environmental uh, part of UN saying, yes, organic. And organic farming is the only way to feed the world. This has been out there for years, uh, capturing carbon in the soils. And Soil for Climate is doing tremendous work in, in, in Africa. And now they have partnered with us in, in our regenerative hubs to show that we can reduce emissions. Actually, sulfur carbon is looking for less than 300 parts per million. I'd be satisfied with 350 parts per million CO2. And here's the difference. Chemical, soil on the left, organic soil on the right. Who can fix carbon? Who can capture huge amounts of carbon in the soil? Biodiversity. So we're not talking about polar bears uh, or pandas. We're talking about soil biodiversity. We're talking about all sorts of live life on the planet. California is paying its farmers for carbon farming. Carbon farming, yes, we're, they're paid to sequester carbon. We have a tremendous opportunity by recovering agrobiodiversity. Uh, we used to use so many different species and now we're down to 15 plant and eight animal species to produce 90% of our food. Here again, we have a tremendous job to recover all these products that we've used for thousands of years along our Another thing we have to bring in, creative management. And I've been calling this creative management for 20 years already. It's actually using scenarios, looking forward, and checking which is the best scenario or worst, less worst scenario, and how do we pull development these scenarios. What do we have to do to achieve the best scenario? Um, all our countries now have maps and they tell us exactly which parts of the country are subject to, to important changes in the future with drought, with flooding, and so on. Vulnerability. Mayors are not using that, but we have to get to use those scenarios. We've developed together with other partners future scenarios, socioeconomic scenarios, for scenario-guided policy and investment planning. We actually, the INDCs that Costa Rica presented in Paris, uh, 
were subjected to our scenario methodology and fine tweaked. And Costa Rica is one of the five countries that promised would want to save the planet. Uh, Honduras adaptation strategy was, was set against scenario. Um, how do we face this? We need to educate and we need to educate young people, professionals, even older people to work in uncertainty. We are now in permanent change. That's the, the normal is permanent change. Disruption, um, changing institutional, frame, institutional frameworks. So we need to learn in different ways. The major MBA school model was, okay, the first student they go ahead, leaving all his classmates behind, that was success. Now success for now in looking to the future is that individual who can actually collectively engage the community to move forward. We have to go from the famous clusters to a co-creational process and social networking allows us to do this. Technology allows us to do this. We've established a network of hubs with Capital Institute where we're gonna be practicing a lot of collective learning through interchange of experiences with different parts of the planet. So if we look at capacity development, it doesn't matter if it's face-to-face, -face, online, blended, whatever, we need to go from knowledge-based to having people be able to do things. And that is skills and attitude. But I always add passion. It's not only the competences, it's passion. There's a whole chapter of, on capacity development in this book we published back a few years ago. So, and this I brought out of internet. It doesn't have an author, but I love it. Um, how is exponential change? So, we humans are taught to think in a linear fashion. And what we're facing now is exponential change. So we are having an exponential growth surprise. If we look at our way of thinking, and we think of 30 steps, one meter steps, we move forward 30 meters. If we do incremental thinking, 30 exponential steps takes us 26 times around the planet. So we need to start seeing how we can shift the mindset to think exponentially. Global change is happening exponentially. Technology development, artificial intelligence is all happening exponentially. And we're seeing a change in our educational system. Singularity in the university, Udacity, Udemy, Build Academy, all of these new universities are going to make other universities be obsolete. And their focus is mainly on technology and artificial intelligence. I actually think we have to look a lot at the local knowledge. Here's Manuel Castellanos, he's a Lacandon Indian with his traditional knowledge. On the left, you can see um, people from a very famous university up north. And this was a piece of land that was totally degraded. After nine years is when I took this photo. Manuel could reestablish his ecosystem. All the high tech of this university only could establish what you see. I stuck my hand in half a meter of organic soil with 5% carbon. This is regeneration. We have lots of material now. Design regenerative culture, Danielle Christenval here is a fabulous piece of work. Um, I've, I've, this is now my, my Bible. Uh, and we do need to design cultural processes to make change happen. Um, a lot of other people, Otto Sharma with his U theory and moving from an eco, eco system to ecosystem economics, where instead of having man up top, the woman below, and the rest of life below, now we're circular. Going to economics, Kate Raworth, I, I met her, I think last year. She's done an amazing uh, job by establishing this donut economy principles, which actually gave origin to the graphs I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Um, Christian Felber with Economy of the Common Good, he's actually very clear in that the term economics was actually an economy that supports the common good. And what we're seeing now is not called economy, it's called krematistike in, in Greek, and it's actually about making money. So we actually need to move uh, away from the profit-oriented competition. We need to go from financial benefits to the contribution of the common good. And I recommend his stuff uh, taking up very quickly in Europe, 
several thousand companies are already are working on this and municipalities are working on this in Spain and in Latin America. It's, it's actually a very powerful process and it's a huge opportunity for new forms of business. The blue economy from Gunter Pauli, lots of examples on how to do things in a circular, natural way. Uh, TEAB, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity that came out uh, almost a decade ago now, how to internalize externalities, the whole ecological economics concept developed by Bob Constanza uh, 25 years ago or more. Uh, social progress integrator instead of the GDP. This is, again, this, this map came out this morning. Um, I suggest you go in and, and look at it, you know. Um, and if we look at it with measuring social projects for different ways instead of GDP, Costa Rica is not that far away from Germany. So I'm not sure how much we have to still develop to be able to be a country of well-being. And we're going to be moving into the well-being economy very soon. Um, Costa Rica, Scotland, Slovenia are actually trying to turn our normal economics into a well-being economy. I'll be telling you more about that in a few months after we launch this. We've launched initiatives with regenerative tourism based on slow tourism and other initiatives from 20 years ago, 10 years ago. We're actually having a group now working on regenerative tourism and more and more organizations are also coming up with regenerative tourism. So in order to be able to make these changes, we do need new leadership. We need new forms of governance. We need to look for joint opportunities. We need equity, equality, and opportunities. And we need to value people for what they are. Uh, so we've come together to establish a regenerative hub in Costa Rica. We're having four future hubs in the in process, uh, local, which will cover about 15,000 square kilometers of the country, where we'll be bringing in all these regenerative practices on the ground and looking for the results I already talked about. Beautiful group of, of partners. Um, Capital Institute is leading the regenerative network globally. Uh, Gaia Education, we're here. Um, Ocean Business is a company that based in Israel that is bringing the most advanced technology to our organic agriculture. I don't think uh, a lot of young people want to go back to the hoe and, and the shovel, but we can actually bring top-notch, um, intelligent agriculture uh, technology to the organic agriculture and increase productivity and make it easier. Natural Pact, that's the organization that's working on painting the landscapes. Fundación Plan 21, uh, long-term partner of UCI. Uh, we have a Institute for Sustainable Tourism together for about 10 years. They've developed a lot of methodologies for reducing carbon and, and measuring carbon footprint. Blueprints Org, uh, Srila Manuja Mission Trust from India, the Center for Applied Cultural Evolution. We're actually establishing a school for applied cultural evolution over the next weeks here in Costa Rica. Saver Institute with their uh, regenerative cattle, holistic cattle management, um, very promising. So we have all these partners that already know what they're doing and we're just going to bring them together and start working on site-based. Um, about 12 years ago when we started working on regenerative development, you could Google it and something would come up in agriculture. Google today, um, development, and you'll be surprised. The Royal Academy of Engineering asked me a few years ago to, to write something regenerative development for engineers worldwide. So a lot of other sectors are starting to feel it. And uh, Leonardo Boff inspires me a lot. I, I recommend you reading him. Uh, he has over 130 books published. And he's talking about a new phase in humanity. We're all returning to the common house. And um, exchanging experiences and values, we enrich ourselves and complete ourselves mutually. And this is networking. And this is what we're actually experiencing right with us. So we are looking for the emergence of a global civil society where we decrease consumption, optimize production. We have to start valuing people and society for what they are, not for, not for how much they 
we have. Um, and we need to train hundreds of thousands of young people who are willing to make the change happen. And this is something that we can see now in tourism. 80% of millennials are worried about sustainability when they go travel. So they'll actually request sustainability things that their previous generation, my generation, didn't really care for. So for sure, I know we cannot keep on the path we're going. The earth doesn't support it anymore. And if earth doesn't support it, it won't support us. Uh, the first sentence in the Earth Charter, and those who don't know the Earth Charter, look it up. You can read it, 32 languages. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. So it's up to us, people living today, uh, if we have a planet for future development or don't have a planet. And um, my six-year-old son, Sebastian, I do hope that in 10 years' time, maybe 15 years' time, he says to me, thanks, Dad, for having tried it. I for sure hope he'll be able to say, hey, dad, thanks for having made life for me in the future possible. I just don't want him coming up and saying to me, what were you guys thinking about? You know, more thinking about all the future, uh, using all the resources for your fun and your enjoyment and being up in place. Uh, so let's, let's hope we are remembered for the awakening of this new reverence for life. This is also from the Earth Charter, it's the last sentence, the joyful celebration of life. So, are we going to keep on waiting till something happens? Are we going to expect the United Nations to solve our problems? Are we going to expect our president to solve our problems? Or are we going to take action? I talk a lot with politicians. I've given over 50 conferences, politicians, parliaments, and they always come up pretty pissed off at the end, sorry for the word, um, and say, well, what are we supposed to do? And I always tell them the same thing. Look at yourself in the mirror and think of what you're gonna do during the day. If what you're gonna do during the day is gonna benefit the environment, benefit people, benefit your family, benefit your friends, benefit people you don't know, then go ahead and do it. If what you're gonna do during the day, make decisions that are gonna favor a few, but not majority, if your decisions are going to imply further damage to the environment, then don't do it. So change starts with us. So thank you. And I think uh, we can now go to the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Edward. This is uh, so uplifting and uh, enlightening presentation you just gave us, um, giving us a peek of all the things that are already being done <clears throat> that makes regeneration possible uh, if we put our minds to it. And as you say, if we continue training young and old alike into regenerative thinking and practices. Very wonderful. So I would like to uh, invite participants to pose questions uh, for Edward. We may have another 10 minutes or so um, <clears throat> in this pace. But uh, please post your questions in the uh, Q&A um, area instead of the chat. Um, the chat is okay. Do I, have, I have one first question. Yeah. Uh, how do we get involved and support your work? Just look us up. Uh, look at the network of hubs. Uh, I think what we can do is, is when Gaia posts this up on, onto its page, we can put several of the links in. Look at Capital Institute and their regenerative network of hubs. Um, look at us at the University of International Cooperation, uci.ac.cr. Look at Gaia Education page. I mean, we're open. Uh, this is collaboration we're looking forward to. Uh, it is actually uh, a big platform for collaboration. So we're totally open to having more people try to work with us, learn with us, and us helping other people. We expect through the Capital Institute Network to be able to open at least 30 other hubs in different countries over the next hopefully one year maybe even more than that so we're totally open to to discussion um yes i don't know if there's another question very nice yeah um let me see i'm trying to uh see if i can see the questions i can't see them myself but maybe you can there's there a couple of questions there yeah a couple of no questions um 
How can we engage civic, civil society in countries where thinking about nature is, a, is considered a privilege, given the economic and political context? Well, education. Education, education, education. It's, we need to educate all levels. Um, and our education system is totally biased. I mean, it was developed for training people to be uh, workers in the industry. It wasn't uh, meant to train people to be critical. I mean, the establishment doesn't want people who are critical. Uh, they're just uh, to actually look at how we can unlearn what we've learned. Um, I don't know if you saw the news, but Singularity University and Google and Facebook and a lot of other uh, Silicon Valley companies decided to not hire people, uh, not hire people by their university titles. Um, they're actually hiring people without a university degree because otherwise they have to first have them unlearn all the wrong stuff that they learned. I mean, the discipline, uh, having a teacher up front and keeping the, the class quiet, it just takes away all creativity of children and, and even university students. So we are going to re, be working on the reinvention of, um, of education. And John Brewer, Joe Brewer, sorry, and even Daniel Van, who's just here with us, uh, he says, uh, it, was, it was great, lots of love, no questions, only agreement, regenerating, rising. Yes, we're going to be working uh, starting November on redesigning education with a blank sheet. We're looking at all other systems, the Waldorfs and all the other, the Green School in Bali, and, and, but we're not going to stuck, get stuck with them. We're going to actually start with a white canvas and start painting on how our children have to be prepared to face disruption in technology, disruption in jobs, and planetary collapse, planetary collapse. Excellent. Um, I see a few more questions. Some of them are just uh, sending you personal messages, uh, Eduard, and uh, maybe uh, you'll respond to those later. But in terms of questions, um, th uh, there is one here that says, um, what is your opinion about no-till farming? Well, these practices <laughs> are, hundreds of years old. Um, and they actually have shown to be the way to produce. But the chemical companies, together with governments, together with universities, have actually distorted agriculture. Uh, I know several important universities, even my country, that are actually educating chemical salesmen. They're not agronomists. They're not fruit producers. They're chemical salespeople. And um, these universities, if you look into it, they're supported by the chemical companies. They give donations, research grants, scholarships. So they're not really willing to go against uh, and bite the hand that's giving them resources to operate. So we really need to rethink um, the whole process. And yes, going back to local knowledge, actually people on the ground, living in the ecosystems, will know how to adapt a lot better than scientists sitting in a crystal building on the fifth floor. So we need to start the dialogue. It's in Spanish, it's called Dialogo de Saberes, exchanging dialogue between scientists and local people. And this is not bringing uh, local knowledge to the universities. It's actually bringing information like, or science like climate change. Uh, Manuel Castellanos in, in the Chiapas area of Mexico that have millinery knowledge about regenerating ecosystems, he does not know about climate change. He has uh, a few initial ideas, but if we actually want him to be able to adapt his knowledge, he needs to start learning about climate change. So it's useless taking uh, his knowledge to a university in France or in UK or the US uh, because that will never get back to him. We need to bring those universities, those research programs down to the ground. And that's what Samuel Levy Tarter has been doing for about 20 years now. So yes, we, we, we look at uh, traditional practices very strongly. Great. There is uh, a question here from uh, 
Ben Muller. I'm not sure if you are all related. Yes, <laughs> I know Ben very well. <laughs> For so several ben, years now. Uh, ben asks, how can we approach people that have never been exposed to these concepts and change their mentality within one generation? Well, I actually was in Austin, Texas uh, a few months ago, and I was invited to speak at the church. And I gave uh, a similar talk, of course, uh, with a lot simpler language. Uh, and coming out of the church, people aligned and said, how can we be part of this? How can you help us change? Uh, so people are pretty open, even people that are stubborn. I mean, you have interests like some presidents that are there to defend undefendable interests. You won't get them to change. But a lot of the people, once they're getting informed, once they're actually aware of what's happening, uh, they're willing to. And this is, I think, the question should go to, to Daniel Val, because in his book, Regenerative Cultural Design, which I showed earlier, a lot of it is here. How, how to do this, how to accomplish this change, a lot of it is here. The Earth Charter also gives us tools. And um, with Joe Brewer, we're gonna be working on, on, on this systematic uh, change, the cultural evolution. How, how do we actually get people to, to change their, their cultural uh, platform and the basis. Wonderful. Uh, one more question, perhaps, um, from Robert Start. Is it possible to follow this education project you were just talking about? It's going to be, we're going to be posting. Uh, if you look at me in Facebook or Joe Brewer, uh, even Daniel, we're, we're very active in, in Facebook exchanging ideas. And this community is growing. A lot of people have said, hey, can we be part of it? Uh, yesterday I was meeting with the director of a school here and when I told him about it, he says, can I be part of it? Yes. Um, so I guess uh, there will be several links in, in this post that can lead you to us. If not, just look us up in, in Google, you'll find us. And we're more than glad to share everything. Um, we have to go to open knowledge. I mean, our science system has failed because first they go and it's the responsibility of a researcher to publish. It's not his responsibility to make sure that his information is being used for making decisions. Uh, the whole incentive system of universities, actually the so whole ranking system of universities is totally uh, useless. 40% is the amount of papers published in peer reviewed journals. I would actually, uh, evaluate scientists about how much of their knowledge and, and their research results is used for decision making at political or even corporate level. Um, so it's our fault uh, to be putting all this information and, and knowledge and science into uh, magazines instead of turning it into um, wisdom, as I mentioned in my, my talk. So for us to be able to move forward we have to open everything. Um, one of the schools we visited in an Asian country, a very famous school, they're not willing to give out their corporate secret, uh, but they're actually wanting to, to sell out franchising licenses. That's not the way to go. Uh, we need to collaborate. We need to move away from the traditional system of greed to a system of collaboration. Exactly right. Well, Edward, there probably there may be a few more questions, but actually, uh, this is all the time we have for this webinar today. Uh, I want to thank you again for this uh, wonderful webinar, and I want to point out some of the uh, resources that we have at Gaia Education. Please visit our website, of course, gaiaeducation.org. Visit the uh, University for International Cooperation, UCI. Um, for courses and uh, more information as how we can uh, continue to develop the skills and learn about regenerative development and turning things around. You can see now that it is possible thanks to this wonderful presentation that was just uh, gave us. And uh, uh, let me see what else we have here. Um, Before you go, Giovanni, um, yes. discuss the possibility of, of giving this webinar in Spanish. Yes non English speaker. So uh, if there is interest, please let us know. And then we can probably in about two weeks offer it in, in Spanish. 
I'd be glad. Thank you for uh, uh, reminding me of that, Edward. Uh, we will uh, schedule a Spanish version of this webinar um, in approximately two weeks. It's not scheduled yet, but it just came up as an idea, and I think it will be wonderful for our Spanish-speaking publics um, to hear that. So uh, visit our website. We'll have it announced there. And in our website, you will also see uh, many other resources, uh, the SDG flashcards, community implementation of the flashcards. Um, uh, there is a handbook for doing that that you can purchase or download. Um, you can also find curriculum material and um, uh, writings, the four keys uh, on the four dimensions of sustainability. You can become a uh, Gaia Education Certified Trainers by following a few simple steps, taking some courses and preparing yourself for that. And uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on Facebook and other social media. So thank you, Edward, and thank you all for uh, joining us in this presentation today. Thank you, till next time. Till next time. And Pedro, I think we can uh, uh, stop the recording. Yes, I'm doing that. Excellent. And uh, I'm going to close the room now. Thank you.